being chosen for this. That's not even all of us. What song have I chosen for? Come on, ushers. Testament for a while. I'm going back to the Old Testament, Michael. <laughs> going back to the Old Testament. Um, don't know where I'm going after this. Uh, well, I guess I'll tell you tomorrow <laughs> where I'm going after this. I like, well, I like the whole Bible. Amen. But I like finding little known stories and bringing, I won't say stories, little known accounts or little known events that people. You don't hear about in Sunday school growing up as a kid and, and, and kind of diving into those. And then I like taking the well-known stories. Sorry, I said stories again. Well-known accounts of things that happened and, uh, and diving into those a little more and seeing just what this, what, what, what this passage or, or whatever it may be was all about. Because I like to read the Bible as, as a human because these were humans. We read it so many times as a story with things happening so fast, we don't give it time to, to resonate that these people had to sit and think about these things they were going through. They went through agony, loss, pain, sickness, hangnails, uh, baldness. You know, they went through everything that everybody else goes through. These were real people. Right, right, Ronnie? Real people who went through real things and had real struggles. And a lot of times we, don't, we can't resonate with them because we don't think of them that way. We, we, we kind of elevate them to superhuman status, especially if it is a story where there is immense faith. Or, but it's, you have the same Holy Spirit there with you as these people did. We're going to look in 1 Kings chapter 17, very, very well-known passage of Scripture. Uh, Love, love this, this passage, and 
I titled this message, All That You Have Left. All That You Have Left. Um, Because we're going to see a a lady here that all she has left. And we'll see what happens because of all that she has left. But to start with here, we're we're introduced to Elijah. Elijah the Tishbite. And I'll give you just a little bit of background. I want you to go, if you can backtrack just a few verses to chapter 16, verse 30. We'll start with 30. This is the beginning of Ahab's reign in uh, in the kingdom of Israel, the northern ten tribes. And it says, And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord, above all that were before him. And it came to pass, as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel. Jezebel. The daughter of Ethbaal. Ethbaal. Ethbaal in some translations. The king of the Zidonians. And went and served Baal and worshipped him. That's very important. The king of the Zidonians. What was, what was Jonah's problem? When, when God told Jonah to go to Nineveh, what was his problem? Of course he didn't like them. He didn't like it. Would be, it would be like telling a Jew to go and witness to Adolf Hitler or Adolf Eichmann or any of those infamous Holocaust figures there. It would be the same thing. You would, they probably would not want God to save them, especially if they knew that he could and would. They might not want it. It would be awful to be in that situation as a human in the flesh to go and before your mortal enemy who has no compassion. We're not talking about someone who you don't get along with or you don't like. These These are people that would kill you and not think anything of it. So we're dealing with those kind of people here. And Elijah comes across that. But you never see him complain. But we're going to see what type of environment this woman lived in. Uh, going back to chapter 17, uh, we're going to start in verse number 8. But in 1 through 7, Elijah has pronounced the drought. How long did the drought last? Anybody know? Who's, I heard it. Three and a half years. So we can basically say that the span of this, the rest of this chapter went on for three and a half years. He was there with her. He was there with her uh, right, up until, uh, right up until the time that he goes back to Ahab and challenges again. So that's a long time, and we read it as if it's just a few days or a day or two. So I want you to put yourself in the position of both Elijah and this woman and see how this would have played out. Uh, so he's pronounced the flood. He, brings, he, he takes him away from the battle for just a little bit. God brings Elijah away from the battle just a little bit. He goes to a brook, and he drinks... And how does he eat? The ravens feed him. And the ravens bring him food, bring him meat. And it comes to pass in verse 7, after a while the brook dried up. And God said, all right, it's time to go. So in verse 8 here, it says, And the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise and get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to... Zidon, Zidon, the Zidonians. Hmm. Who's from there? That's where Jezebel's from. Not, not my ideal spot for a vacation, Lord. Don't, don't really want to go there. Not, not where I would, would I, I would have picked to uh, wait out this, uh, this drought here, uh, which belongeth to Zidon and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman to, there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful 
of meal in a barrel and a little oil in a jar. And behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son that we may eat it and die. Now, there was a famine, there was a drought, but what was there no shortage of? There's no shortage of sticks, was there? How poor she is, she's only able to get two. She's not, she is extremely poor. I don't know, you may have. Someone in here may have at one time or another turned over their very last dollar. I've been fortunate enough in my life, I have never had to turn over my very last dollar and pray from that point on. She's, a, she's lost everything. But let's go back. I want to go back for just a minute. This lady lives in Zarephath, which is in the land of the Zidonians. And, and obviously this man's, the man that's king there is pretty evil. He is a bell worshiper. Now we don't think a whole lot of that. There, there's a couple things I, I, I would like people to read as if you, if you can find it and if you need the names of it and the authors of it, I'll give it to you later. But there's a couple of articles about Baal worship. Do we really grasp what Baal worship was? These people, the people in Israel, did not forsake the worship of Yahweh. Totally. They still believed. They still worshiped. They still went through the practice, albeit they went to the wrong mountains. But even the people down in Judah who went to the right mountain in Jerusalem... They still practiced Baal worship. See, what they had was a God in a time of crisis, and then they had a God for their everyday life. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> Sounds like a lot of people today, doesn't it? Baal worship has not left us. Changed names, changed forms, but it's not left us because all the characteristics are still there, and if you don't believe we're getting closer and closer to it, watch TV for five minutes. Watch a sporting event. Watch something on TV and you will see the way we begin to progress toward this. This woman lives in the center of Baal worship. And she says, as surely as the Lord thy God lives. I believe she is a believer in Yahweh God. Was her husband? We don't know. Was he killed for his faith? We don't know. I, I don't know the circumstances behind what made her a widow. But I do believe she is a follower of God. I believe she knows the true God. Um, Baal worship. What did they do? What was Baal worship? He was the God of what? Uh, he has a lot of different names. They, they, they'll be like Baal something and Baal something else and Baal something else. Uh, one of those is fertility. And we all know what that's going to involve. That's going to involve very uh, immoral acts. Uh, lewdness, crudeness, uh, nastiness, filthiness. And that, that, that was, that was, but it's all the things that the flesh loves. It was all the things that the flesh didn't mind experiencing. So they had a God of those times, the good times, and then in crisis, they would call upon Yahweh God to deliver them when this other God would not. Just the, the same cycle went through the judges in the, in the book of Judges over and over and over. Go, they, they would be in God's fellowship, in fellowship with God. Then they would fall, idol worship. The judgment would come. They would pray back to Yahweh. And it was just a vicious circle over and over and over. But it was God showing his faithfulness to his people. He's always there to forgive. Unless, you know, like Tom says on Wednesday nights, unless you die first. You've got you to gotta live to be able to accept his forgiveness. Um... One of those articles is Modern Baal Worship in Theaters, Stadiums, and Living Rooms. Modern Baal Worship uh, by a man named Scott Brown. Modern Baal Worship in Theaters, Stadiums, and Living Rooms. Of course, you've got uh, the Baal's mother in that mythology was who? Anybody know? Her name is, a lot, is mentioned a lot in the Bible. Asherah. The Asherah poles, which, uh, you know, depicted lots of filthy things, were also, according to this guy, used in ways that you might find in what we would call gentlemen's clubs. 
nasty filthiness that this Baal worship uh, included. Think of, well, I, I, I hate to say it like this. I won't have you, while we're in church having a, having a service, I'll just go ahead and tell you, I won't have you think of any. These Baal worshipers were obsessed with body functions. Not just sexual functions, but body functions. That is why most of the immoral words, the cuss words that we hear, involve defecation or sexual immorality. It all goes back to Baal worship. It all goes back to paganism. And that's what we allow through, like he says, in theaters, stadiums, and living rooms. You say stadiums, sports stadiums. They would go and watch open acts of immorality, public acts of sexual immorality happen on the stadium floor. You say, well, we don't do that. If you've watched anything in the past few weeks, that's what we see. It is what we see. You go and watch TV, that's all that's on. You, I love movies. I love to watch movies, especially history movies and, and things like that. You can make a good movie without a cuss word and without nudity. You can do that. But the world doesn't want it. The world doesn't want it. And this is the type of world we live in today. We're no different than the widow. The widow is living in an awful, awful environment. And she's a believer. No wonder she's poor and ostracized because nobody cares about this believer over here. She, she doesn't believe like we do. No wonder she would be poor. And Elijah comes to her. Here's Elijah, whose sworn enemy is Jezebel. He's going to her hometown, her home country. He's probably not well looked upon either. So let's talk about what he does with, with this, what, what God does with this woman. Uh, I'm going to go back and read verse 10. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel, a little bowl, a little cup, that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, okay, right there, what was she going to do? I can give you water. I got water, I can do that. I got water, I can do that for you, Lord. I got, I got enough of that. I can give you water. He called to her and said, And bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil in a jar. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, prepare it, get it ready, that we may eat. And die. She's, she's given herself a death sentence. Now think how long that would take. I'm not in the uh, medical field by any stretch. But if you had enough for a small meal, you got a little bit of nutrients, it would probably depend on what state you're in, how long she's saying this would go on. Probably three or four days maybe. She's got water. Water's readily available. I don't know how long it would take to just physically starve to death. But she's at a point where she sees no hope that in that span of time she can get anything else to eat. I've never turned over my last dollar, and I for sure have never turned over my last dollar with no hope of the next paycheck coming in, the next source of food. There was nothing left coming in. And imagine if that was the case with you and God told you to go do something. Lord, I, you know, I really need to take care of me right now. I need to take care of me. I need to take care of my family. Can that wait till, till you meet my needs first? That's not what, that's not what happens here. And she's, or in verse 13, And Elijah said unto her, Fear not. Fear not. And go... Go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste, 
Neither shall the jar of oil fail until the day that the Lord send rain on the earth. God's saying, I don't need everything that you've ever been. God knows that we cannot go back in time and give him a circumstance back. He knows we can't do that. But he can't, how, many, how many in here is old? How many in here is sick? Tired? Who's sick and tired of being old? But you're alive. You don't have... You don't have the entirety of the life you've already lived in front of you, but you got something left. All that you have left is what he wants. Just all you got left. He's not asking for more than she has. He's not asking her to do something she's not capable of doing. He says, give me all you got. Give me all you got, and I'll take care of you. For thus the Lord God of Israel... For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the barrel, shall not wa- the barrel of meal shall not waste, and the jar of oil fail until the day that the Lord sends rain. And verse 15, she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she, the widow, and he, Elijah, and her house did eat many days. They did eat many days. It worked. Imagine that. Doing what the Lord said worked. Now that doesn't mean right now at this point in your life, if you're starving to death, if you make Tom a meal, that God will magically fill your cabinets. That's not what it's saying. Because that's not what he's commanded us to do in this day. In this day and age, she was to feed the prophet and to make sure his message still was able to go forward. And he was there a while, a good long time. Good long time. But guess what? Things take a turn for the worse. After she's done this, after she has given all she's got, in verse 17, and it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick and his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. He was what? He was dead. Dead, dead, dead. Not almost dead, not fainted. He was dead. There was, uh, you wonder why the, why the Bible puts things, or why God, the Holy Spirit put that in there? So people could say, guess what? He was dead. It wasn't a swooning or a, a, a fainting. He was dead. And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Have you come unto me to call my sin into remembrance and to slay my son? Think back to all... We don't know what her sin was. We've never been given that. We don't know what it was. But think back to all of that that went along with Baal worship. All that public immorality, all those things, the child sacrifice that went into it, all the things of Baalism, it could have been any number of things. Or it could have been a whole bunch. She's saying, have you remembered my sin and brought it up before me to slay my child? Whatever it was, it stuck with her. Anybody got anything like that? You don't have to raise your hand but think something you've done. It just sticks. And, and you know it's covered and you know that it's that it's forgiven, but the devil just keeps bringing it back. He keeps bringing it back. And he said unto her, Give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up into a loft where he abode and laid him on the bed. The language there, and he took her out of her bosom. What does that tell you, ladies? What was she doing? She was holding on for dear life in utter agony. He wasn't like, she was wailing. Put yourself in that position. You know, she didn't just say, have you brought my sin up? She was screaming it, wailing it. And he cried unto the Lord God and said, O Lord my God, have have you brought this evil upon the widow with whom I sojourn, whom I stay in with, by slaying her son? He, He had questions too. But he followed the Holy Spirit and he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him Again, 
And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again. And he revived his life, his soul came back in. And Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber and into the house and delivered him unto his mother. And Elijah said, See, thy son liveth. And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is truth. Now after this he, he goes on and, and God tells him to go to Ahab. But he had to do this first. He had to do this first. This was no doubt uh, helped build his faith and his character and go through a hard time and a time of waiting Lord, when are we going to do these things? What what am I going to do? I'm just sitting here for for a while, a time of waiting. But I don't want to focus really on Elijah. I want to focus on the lady who gave all she had. Can you think of anywhere else in the Bible where someone gave all they had? The the widow's might. Luke chapter, I believe it's, is it 21? I think it is. It's the first four verses of one of those chapters. I believe it's Luke 21. The widow's might, she gave... He said, compare all these other people I had just given so much. And he said, she gave everything. You gave just a little bit. And what was that for? That was for the word of God to go out. The, 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 the temple sacrifices to carry on just like they were supposed to. It was a ministry. Anybody else? Jesus. When was that? When would that have been? <laughs> gave all he had. He gave all he had. I'll get back to that in just a minute. You, you had to bring Jesus up before I was ready for you to, but that'll work. <laughs> Think about this lady. This lady, she gave all that she had. When you give, there are immediate effects. Immediate effects. She gave, and it solved the problem of hunger for Elijah. And God miraculously intervened. Can you believe that? God intervened. And he never let the oil barrel run dry. Now, did he just fill the barrel up and leave it? Why? He didn't, he didn't just fill it there and leave it. Why? God being God in his infinite wisdom probably knew that if he filled it up and it was always, if he just filled it up once, what would she have done? They lost. She'd have probably used it all. It's kind of like when we go get groceries. By the time we go get groceries, it's been so long we, since we've had groceries, we eat half of them that night. <laughs> You'd think we'd never been fed. And then I wake up going, I've got honey buns. <laughs> See the honey bun. <laughs> but also, if it's full and sitting there, guess what's going to undoubtedly get out? Word's going to get out. And you're in a time of famine and drought. God just provided just what she needed all the time. We don't, I I highly doubt it was just, she had a a building with truckloads of barrels of oil ready to go. He just kept replenishing, just like he did in the wilderness. It was a, it was a, and it was a faithful thing for her. You ever think she wondered, I wonder if this is ever going to run out? Can you imagine on those hard days? And it was a joy to her every day when she went to see that the Lord had provided for her again. Every day. Every day they ate. Faith had immediate effects, both natural and supernatural. She met the need of a, of a hungry man, and God met her need supernaturally every day. Immediate effects. When you give something, time, energy, money, knowledge, lessons you've learned, there are immediate effects. Immediate effects. And then there's long-term effects that go on. Because she did this, now now listen, this may sound morbid, her son was going to die either way. Whether she obeyed or whether she didn't, her son was going to die either way. He would have died of starvation, and if they hadn't have been starving, there's nothing to tell us that this sickness would not have come over him. I don't believe sickness is a byproduct of obedience. It was just nature taking its course. Think about, who knows what it could have been. Think about all the people that could have died of simple, what we call simple things. Appendicitis, today that it takes like that to fix. And they didn't have any way of knowing. Imagine the things that, it it was coming. 
Her son was going to die either way. But because she obeyed, guess who was there? The man of God was there. And the man of God had faith. And he raised her son because she gave all she had. You can't expect for God to raise someone from the dead and have the preacher crawl on them today and then come back from the dead. That's not what this is about. But because she did something, God intervened later on. Why? Because there was a lesson learned. There was a faithfulness learned over and over and over again. Every day when she woke up and saw that barrel renewed, her faith was there. Uh, on a side note, notice there's no mention of her sin. Because guess what? Her sin was gone. Her sin was forgiven. I mean, it was, it was forgiven. When God forgives the sin, it was gone. Elijah never agreed with her and said, no, that's it. No. But think about this. Only, only when we do those things in the sight of other people and in, uh, in the presence of other people especially younger people, can that act and that deed go on and be repeated? Because undoubtedly, who knows? Well, I won't say undoubtedly. Who knows? You, you only give it a chance for it to go on if you do it in front of younger people. Her mother took a huge, a huge risk with her life and his. And he watched. As her mother made the man of God a cake first. You think he was able to tell about that all the years later? All the many years? Now there's a possibility that he never, that he didn't care when he got older. There is that possibility. He lived in a pagan society and he may not have even wanted anything to do with the faith of his mother. It happened then, it happens today. But you don't give it a possibility. You don't give it a shot for it to go on if you don't do things in front of young people and let that act go or even older people to tell and to remember as it goes on and on and on why are you here what's the point of all this do you ever do you ever think that you think, what is the point of all this living because it ain't going to matter a hill of beans how many championships your favorite team wins it's not going to matter a hill of beans how much money you made in this life and it might matter with what you did with it, but faithfulness is honored whether you made millions or, or hundreds. What is the point of all of it? I was reading a thing the other day that was talking about uh, kids are pressured today. I get that, to, to be the best in sports, to be the best in, in class and to get good grades and to do good on ACTs and to do good on, and we push that and push that and push that. But in the end, what does that matter if they don't have lessons of faith sewed in? What does it matter? If we don't do things, if we don't give all we've got, all we got left, what, what inspiration is it to the next generation coming up to give anything at all? Give all we have left. Because when you give all you have left... That's all it takes with God. That's all it takes. Think to the garden. Jesus was ending the, the end of his life. He didn't have the three and a half years prior. He didn't have that left. All he had left was these few hours. And he went to the garden and he's bleeding from his, from his pores. He's sweating blood. He doesn't have a whole lot of strength left. Probably at that point, his body's wearing out. He's got something bad. Heartache, heartbreak. And he says, not my will, but thy will. I give it all to you. And there were immediate, immediate effects of that. Sin was forgiven. On the cross, the judgment of sin took place. All sin, future sin. Past sin, current sin, the judgment, sin was judged and Jesus won on the cross. Immediate effects. You have later effects. Look at all of you. 
You're here because of the death, burial, and resurrection. But Jesus, the most important one is Jesus didn't do it behind closed doors. Could he have? Yeah. He did it in front of people and said, you, go tell them. Go tell the world. And eventually, they gave all they had for Christ and the gospel. Cost them their lives. Are we to a point we can take a chance with our very life, the life of our kids, for the betterment and the progression of the gospel? The time may come. It's almost like Paul screams it from way back there. It's coming. Persecution is coming. We need to do things while it's easy. We need to do things in this vile world. We look and we say it's getting worse and worse. And, and from where we were at, at a, as a country even 20 years ago, it is progressively getting worse, but it's not new. What we see today, this woman lived through, and she was able to give all she had in awful situations, in awful situations, to help the man of God. What do we give? What do you give? That's what I ask tonight. Anybody got anything? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this day you've given us. Lord, thank you for the scripture, and thank you for, for helping us to dive in and giving us amazing tools and resources to look back and find the, the background behind these days and these people. But, Lord, we thank you for your word. We, we, stay, we want to stay with your word and what it tells us. And it tells us that if we give to you in faith, you will honor that. You will honor that. Lord, if we, if we wave the white flag on our lives and we hand it all over to you, you will honor that. And you will reward us, if not here, in the next life. We can bank on it. Lord, thank you for that promise. Lord, help us to be what we, all we can be and give all that we have in these last days. Because time is short. You know when you're coming, Lord, but we don't. Help us to be, to be ever ready and ever working to bring people to, to, your, to, to, to Jesus, to salvation. Help us to do that every day. Lord, help us to remind us of this lady that gave all she had and help us to do the same. And help us to be ready when the time is near to give all that we have left for your name. I pray that you be with us in all that we do. Prepare our hearts to do your work. Help us to read and study and learn in our own times. And bring us back here to learn more and help us to fall more in love with your word every day. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.